To the town of our free Who rode a stranger one fine day Hardly spoke to folks around him Didn't have too much to say No one dared to ask his business No one dared to make a slip The stranger there among them Had a big iron on his hip Big iron on his heel It was early in the morning When he rode into the town He came riding from the south side Slowly looking all around He's an outlaw loose and running Came the whisper from each lip And he's here to do some business With a big iron on his hip Big iron on his heel Big iron, big iron When he tried to match the ranger with the big iron on his hip Big iron The good, the bad, and the sass The oh hear ye hear ye That wheelie death dealing boy That click click boom That fuck you and fuck whatever's on the other side of you The Colt Python We're talking some fucking muscle baby Out of all the antique garbage and trash that for some reason is still hanging around today in new production. If there was one thing the boomers had gotten right, boys, it's wheel guns. Like, bro, you know how you drive down the road and you see that same Long John Silver sitting there, you know, that sketchy little building that's been sitting there for 20 years, you know, but there's never a car in the parking lot. Yeah, who's keeping that thing open? It's just like wheel guns. Like, who's buying these things? Who's keeping these companies in business? Or so I thought. You see, this all started one day. I was watching the greatest Western of all time. The good, the bad, and the ugly. It's undisputed, it's a fact, don't tell me otherwise. John Wayne ain't got shit on old Blondie. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid may come close, but the man with no name is the fucking goat. Hands down, in discussion, move along, boys. So anyways, I'm watching this masterpiece and I'm like, dog, I gotta learn how to spin the pistols like that. But where do I start? Where do I even get a cool pistol like that? Facebook gun groups? Nah. Some dude whose only training is tactical Little Debbie packing. And he's going to try and flex me with an unfired $12,000 rifle with an optic that hasn't even had the diopter set or even been zeroed. So, what's the next best place? Who on God's green earth would have an affinity for Pilgrim Aged Gats? Your local FUD store, of course. So, I head down to see my cross draw toting, leather holster sporting, big iron packing kings. And boys, did I get the wisdom I sought for. We landed on the absolutely most iconic wheel gun of the end half of the 20th century, the Colt Python. It was introduced in 1955, and there's a reason it's still relevant today. Boy, these things, they are so smooth, butter smooth. So what we have here is the 4.25 inch newest generation Colt Python chambered in the 357 Magnum. Now, revolvers are obviously nothing new to Colt. I mean, they basically are the granddaddy of all revolvers. They pretty much fucking invented them. So yeah, guess there's a thing or two that they know. But this definitely ain't your old, you know, single action Colt Army peacemaker. What we have here is a double action revolver with a much faster loading cylinder than the original and a much faster shooting. So the first revolvers, they were all pretty much single action. This means that every single time you want the gun to go bang, you're gonna have to cock the hammer back, three to four clicks, four clicks if it's a real Colt clone, aim, pull the trigger, the gun goes bang, and after it has gone bang, guys, you essentially have a very persuasive brick in your hand until you cock that hammer back again, revolve the cylinder to a fresh round for the firing pin to hit. You can't just pull the trigger again and again and again until you're on E, but with a double action revolver, you can. Now, one cool thing about revolvers just in general is the cartridges they shoot. They are almost always big old sons of bitches. Now the 357 Magnum, it's pretty much the most popular revolver round of today, but you almost always see these things chambered in big ass Magnum rounds like 44 Magnum, 500 Magnum, hell there's even revolvers that shoot a 410 shotgun shell. So this in my opinion is what really keeps them popular as of today. You're not going to get a semi-automatic handgun chambered, you know, in a 500 Smith & Wesson unless you get a Deagle, but they're about the only ones. It's the most well-rounded and pretty much the most accepted cartridge to the 357 Magnum of stopping power and a good blend of recoil management. You know, it's not gonna snap your hands off when you go to shoot this thing. It hits harder than 99% of most semi-automatic handguns of today, you know, other than really the 10 millimeter. Fun fact, the 357 Magnum, it was developed out of necessity. So 
Back in the old Prohibition days, the old boys, you know, driving the Fords and Chevys and, the, you know, those gangsters running around with the alcohol, they were built much better than just, you know, the decade before. And the 38 Specials that most law enforcement were using at that time really just lacked the punch to get through the doors, the engine blocks and stuff to disable these cars. So the 357 Magnum was born. And to prove its lethality, they shot it through engine blocks and ballistic vests of the time, which, you know, I don't know how good those ballistic vests were at the time, but they did it. Hell, they even took this thing up to Alaska and yeeted a bunch of walruses and grizzly bears. I'm serious, look it up, it's pretty wild. RIP them grizzly bears. So, yeah, good enough for grizzly bears, good enough for bad guys toting liquor. So, with that, it became a wildly popular cartridge at that time. Revolvers were not only cheaper than a quality auto-loading pistol at that time, but for the most part, a little bit more reliable. Ammo just wasn't made to the same standards back then, and, you know, metallurgy just definitely wasn't the same standards back then. People were still very weary of semi-automatic handguns, and, you know, for a decent reason. Hell, a lot of folks, they just took a 357 Magnum up in there, and they're like, oh, damn, and then they held up a 45 ACP, and they're like, yeah, this one's more bigger, this has got to be more gooder. I mean, even by today's standards, the 357 Magnum is a round that you definitely don't want to be on the other side on. I mean, let's be real. I'd prefer not to be on any side of any round, even a sim round. You know, I still have scars in my belly from Johnny Primo stitching me up point blank. Thanks, man. You took away my shirtless modeling career. But anyways, really, the only semi-matic cartridge I really consider carrying, like, over a 357 Magnum in the event of, like, Bear country or like the second invasion of T-Rexes would be like a 10 millimeter. But even then, I'd probably just want to carry like a 44 Magnum. But I digress. Back to the topic at hand. This Colt Python is the newest iteration. There's a brief period in the early 2000s. These were, you know, kind of discontinued. Mostly because, well, the vast majority of law enforcement had moved over to semi-automatics like Glocks and Berettas. No major military had issued them in decades, you know, and pistol matches and like tactical shooting events, you know, were on the rise. And the generation that was born with revolvers, you know, I hate to say it, you know, had begun to die. So, you know, the people that support them, if they die off, well, there's nobody left to support them. And with that, popularity shifts to what is in style. But back by popular demand, the Python is here. Now, I wanted to make this thing kind of more relevant. You know, I didn't want the Pilgrim just, you know, revolver, shoot six rounds, load, that's it, end of story. Because we all know, guys, a gun without a weapon mounted light in an optic is worthless, right? <laughs> Just kidding. But seriously, it does make the tool far more effective and can really aid in the maximizing your potential of the gun. So I found this little company called Evolution Gunworks, EGW. They make a direct drop-on cage for the New Age Pythons. It's literally just a couple screws and that's it. Zero permanent modifications to the weapon, you don't have to drill and tap or anything. It's a great piece and it's machined incredibly well. The fitment to my Python, it was pretty phenomenal. So you take off your iron sight there, you drop that on top and there's a set screw on top. And it's just kind of like one of those things when you drop a piece of metal onto a metal and it's just like and it just like sucks right in, you don't have to force anything, you know it's going to be made well. And that's how it was with the EGW. There's a top-mounted Picatinny rail that covers the entire top of the gun so you can get your optic on. There's a muzzle that hangs over with a compensator. It's a three-port with one big one on the top. And then on the bottom, covering the recoil lug, that's where you put your flashlight on. Now, the muzzle. There's a three-port compensator, three ports on each side, and then one on the top. I wasn't really sure, you know, what to expect with a 357 Magnum, you know, I knew it didn't have a tremendous amount of recoil out of a large frame heavy gun like the Python, but whew, that compensator, it makes a 357 feel like a 9mm. If I could actually pull the trigger worth a fuck on this thing, like, the, you know, the legend Jerry Muselick, it'd probably be a deadly little machine. On top, there's enough rail space too to put an optic on, you know, you could even get like a very powerful scope on it if you want to do some serious target shooting or you know like uh, just a red dot you know for your self-defense or just general purpose. I went with the Trigicon SRO on the dot just because it's a good general purpose little thing. Now the bottom rail that covers the recoil lug it's pretty rad however there is one thing I just gotta say it just doesn't stick down close enough to your hand to manipulate the little paddles on the X300 Surefire. So this isn't just like poor insight you know on EGW's end. It's really just a design of the revolver that limits that. In order to reload this thing, you know, the cylinder's gotta swing out, and if there's a hunk of rail or light there, you're definitely not gonna be able to get a speed loader in there, maybe not even a single bullet in or out. It almost needs like a tape switch with like a surefire scout kind of light. But then comes the question, 
Where the fuck do you put the tape switch? I definitely don't want a random mass wire ran all the way down to the grip. One, I'm gonna ND white light like crazy. And second, revolvers dump a ton of gas out of the side of the cylinder as the chambers aren't sealed. There's only like one revolver that has a sealed chamber and that's the Nagant. Now, I'm sure there might be a few more out there, but that's really the only one I know of. And it's the only kind of revolver that can be suppressed. So, that gas screaming out of that blast zone there is hotter than a $2 pistol and will burn the absolute shit out of you. So one, a tape switch isn't going to work very well because really the only decent spot is going to sacrifice your fingers or the switch because you need to place it pretty close to that cylinder there. And second point, you have to grip a revolver much differently than say, you know, a Glock or a 1911. Like I said, you don't want your fingers roasted. You keep your paws away from that cylinder. I personally like this grip here so my strong hand can maintain a good and firm grip on the weapon while my support hand goes over the top like this. I keep my support thumb on the top here so I can manipulate the hammer in case I want to have a better trigger pull. If I'm doing that all wrong, folks, just let me know because I, I'll be the first to admit, guys, I don't know shit about fuck when it comes to wheel guns, so yeah, I'm open to help. But speaking of triggers, let's talk about it. So it's a double action weapon, meaning that you can fire this weapon with the hammer down or cocked completely back. The only difference is your trigger finger is going to do a whole lot of work if the hammer's down or just a baby little amount of work if the trigger is, I'm sorry, if the hammer is back. Ideally, you'd like to shoot every single round from the hammer back as it's a candy cane like super crispy and light break. It's a single stage at this point and there's absolutely zero slack to be caught up on. You pull it, it's gonna go bang. And brother, it's a clean and crispy candy cane like snap. But that's not terribly realistic to be honest. If you're shooting for speed or say like a self-defense situation, cocking the hammer back every single time you make that gun go bang is just not realistic. Well, I mean, I guess you can make it realistic, but there's just far too much going on, you know, for it to either do it reliably or simply do it as fast as just grip it and rip it on that trigger. Remember, the whole idea, if you ever have to use your weapon in a self-defense situation, you want to eliminate that threat to yourself as quickly and efficiently as possible. An old boy on enough PCP to kill a moose probably ain't gonna feel the first couple rounds. So, you make the thing go bang until that threat is no longer there. And be honest with you, bang, cocking it back, bang, cocking it back, just isn't gonna do it. Grip and rip and pull that trigger as fast as you can, as accurate as you can, and you're gonna be in the best amount of shape. Overall, your best bet in that situation is gonna be using your revolver from the double action position. But the problem is, there is absolutely, positively zero way to put it. Double action revolvers, triggers, they suck monster donkey butt. Bro, it's horrible. It's literally the worst thing in the world. I'd rather drag my ass through a quarter mile of rusty nails than have to shoot a double action revolver for like the rest of my life. Okay, maybe it's not that bad, but also maybe, I don't know. Guys, it's heavy. It's such a long pull. There's like multiple different points of varying resistance. Like for starters, it's super heavy and your accuracy is going to potentially suffer if you're not super well trained on that double action trigger with that much tension on the trigger just to make it break. Now, and also guys, it is a long ass break. It's like an entire inch of movement from start to finish. There's no other real triggers out there in the world that have that do that. And to top it all off, you got to let that bitch reset the same damn distance. It's awful, but that's just the design of a revolver. It's a big, heavy hammer that needs a pretty fair amount of strength to pop them primers. And you can't just lighten the pull down to like a few ounces. I mean, I don't know if you're the world's greatest gunsmith and you know, doing something revolutionary. You might, but because you won't get a reliable primer ignition if you don't have some good weight on that hammer pull. Or, you know, literally, you don't even get any primer ignition at all. And the icing on the cake, there's this goofy little spot of low resistance in the reset that makes you kind of think, okay, it's ready to go bang again. I've let it forward all the way, but it's actually not. It needs to move like a millimeter further forward in order to completely like reset. And it's just like this baby little thing that's like click. And if you don't do that, which you know happens often when you're trying to shoot fast, you go to pull the trigger and it won't budge because the trigger hasn't reset completely and it's literally like locked into place until you go all the way forward. You cannot pull the thing back. It's like pulling against like a brick wall. You know, on the Lord, Jerry Muleschlick, how that dude can shoot a revolver so fast is, I mean, it's, it's unreal. 
after owning Revolver, I have found like a newfound respect for this guy. I genuinely do not understand how this guy does it. Now, I understand, you know, I'm not the world's fastest shooter by any means or anything, but I do know, you know, I kind of got a baby little gif of banging, you know, a trigger kind of fast, but how he does it so fast and so accurate, it, it's legitimately terrifying. Like, obviously, you know, he's not shooting a completely bone stock trigger, you know, when he's setting his world records, but he has before and it's still crazy impressive. The dude's just the revolver goat. Like, whatever, hats off to you, man. I don't know how you do it, but keep fighting the good fight. Anyways, a thing I really wanna to touch on is just the accuracy of this gun. And just, you know, the accuracy of revolvers in general. Revolver is just an inherently more accurate platform than you say your typical auto-loading pistol. Now, of course, can you have a crazy accurate semi-auto and, you know, a terribly inaccurate revolver? Yes, absolutely. But as a whole, the most cheap, revolvers can typically shoot and print better groups than, you know, a decent little, you know, handgun like a Glock. This Colt Python here, guys, it's a freaking laser beam. 100 yard hits on M6, no problem, all day long. 200 yards, it's definitely a little bit more challenge and definitely requires a little bit more focus, but once you find that hold spot, it's pretty dang easy. I even hit one once at 430 yards. I'm not gonna lie to you, it took like 40 rounds to get to that point. As you know, I couldn't even spot my misses, they were so far away. But it can be done relatively often, especially if you know you shoot better than what I can, because you know, I'm genuinely not that impressive of a shot when you compare, you know, to like legit shooters who do this pretty often. So, gentlemen, I believe that makes it a wrap on the Colt Python EGW caged hissing cobra snake gap. Ultimately, you know. Guys, this isn't like a meme gun. I mean, kinda, but not really. But it's something, you know, just overall, I would never seriously consider carrying or like make an effort to like legitimately use, um, you know, in a carry or like duty situation. It's, but it is an absolute blast of a range toy, however. I think I had like my most absolute fun shooting this thing at 200 yards. You know, I plopped a, a you know, shooting bag on the bed rail of my truck and just shot for like an hour. It's an absolute right to make something so small do something, you know, pretty impressive. I genuinely feel like if the wind isn't a complete disaster for you, you could do some serious work with this thing at distance. So, guys, you're asking yourself, do you need one? I mean, I think the answer is yes. Not because it's gonna be your new CCW or duty gun, it's because it's just fun to shoot, reload under pressure, practice, you know, them fine motor skills. And the big round magnum cartridge, it just makes a good ping noise on that steel. I feel like, guys, just a gun owner's collection couldn't ever be complete until they have some sort of like four inch to eight inch magnum cartridge handgun. In order to say, yeah, I've got a good, well-rounded collection, you just gotta get one, whether it's 357, 44 Magnum, or Nitro Double Pumper 500. Go get yourself one, King. You've earned it. Until next time.